their early childhood years, that time when it's so formative, you know, all the childhood development when I was tiger parenting and causing a lot of harm with my control and my anger and my punishment and all of those things. But, you know, when I started shifting and pivoting, there was a lot of healing and a lot of trust has been rebuilt. And so now that my children are older, we have like a great relationship and there's just so much love and trust and appreciation of each other now. Ever feel like you suck at this job? Motherhood, I mean. Have too much anxiety and not enough patience? Too much yelling, not enough play? There's no manual, no village, no guarantees. The stakes are high. We want so badly to get it right. But this is survival mode. We're just trying to make it to bedtime. So if you're full of mom guilt, your temper scares you. You feel like you're screwing everything up and you're afraid to admit any of those things out loud. This podcast is for you. This is Failing Motherhood. I'm Danielle Batman, and each week we'll chat with a mom ready to be real, sharing her insecurities, her fears, her failures, and her wins. We do not have it all figured out. That's not the goal. The goal is to remind you, you are the mom your kids need. They need what you have, you are good enough, and you're not alone. I hope you pop in earbuds, somehow sneak away, and get ready to hear some hope from the trenches. You belong here, friend. We're so glad you're here. Hey, it's Danielle. Welcome back. In this episode, I am interviewing Iris Chen. Iris is a recovering tiger mother and founder of the Untigering Movement. In her book, Untigering, Peaceful Parenting for the Deconstructing Tiger Parent. She shares her journey and reflections on shifting away from parenting rooted in power to parenting grounded in partnership. She's an American-born Chinese who somehow ended up with kids who are Chinese-born Americans. She spent over a decade living and raising her kids in China and now resides with her family in California. She's a peaceful parenting advocate, intersectional unschooler, anti-oppression activist, and deconstructing tiger mom. In this episode, Iris shares how a workshop about brain science began a long journey to deconstructing everything she thought she knew about parenting, school, and even religion. She began to move away from tiger parenting, which is based in control, which was the way she was raised and the culture she was surrounded by, and began a process of reparenting herself. She shares a lot of correlations and wisdom connecting how we relate to ourselves is interconnected with how we show up as parents. She shares gratitude for her strong-willed firstborn, resisting her control and pushing her to learn and grow and find another path. She speaks to the regret of not learning it sooner and how she was able to share her journey so publicly in her book, Without Shame. We also dive into a deeper conversation into her shift from getting all the accolades and awards in formal schooling to finding and loving unschooling as a family. So wherever you're at in your reckoning or movement towards more positive discipline approaches, I know that you will find aspects of your experience in Iris's story and be able to find gems that will keep you going for years to come. So please enjoy this interview with Iris. Welcome to Failing Motherhood. My name is Danielle Bettman, and on today's episode, I'm joined by Iris Chen. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Danielle. So I know we originally connected on Instagram a while ago, and I had been following you because you just cultivate all the best from like all of the, you know, parenting influencers. And there's so much good out there that I did not know was a thing, at least in my first few years of motherhood. And I know probably there's a lot of moms that are either just finding it or overwhelmed by it, or (laughs) haven't found it yet. And that's okay. But I'm excited to be able to share your journey and your story because it's very relatable. And you are just a mom that is sharing her journey of kind of figuring it all out as you go, reconciling that with the way that you were raised and the culture that you're in. And I just so appreciate your transparency. So thank you for your willingness to come on and share with us. Mm, Thank you. 
So go ahead and introduce yourself. I already shared your bio, but just who are you and who's in your family? Yeah. So like you mentioned, I'm Iris. I am now a mom to two teen tweens. So I have two boys who are 12 and 14. And we were living in Asia for many years, but in 2019, moved back to the States. And so have been back for a few years, right before the pandemic. So yeah, like you mentioned, this really, like Untigering has really been about my own journey of shifting away from that authoritarian, hierarchical, controlling, high demand parenting that I grew up with to embrace peaceful parenting. And yeah, it's really been my own journey and like everything that I share on my social media is stuff that I need to remind myself. So I really approach this not as an expert. You know, I don't have any degrees behind my name. I'm not a therapist. I'm not any, I'm just a mom who is learning and is trying to practice this. And so I feel so much for the parents who struggle because I'm that parent, but also encouraging all of us like to, we still need to hold ourselves accountable. We still are responsible to grow and heal and that in community, we can do it. Yes. So just to qualify, have you ever felt like you were failing motherhood? Oh, absolutely. (laughs) All the time. (laughs) But I think nowadays my approach is more like who defines what motherhood is? Like whose standard am I trying to meet? Like there's so much more grace now, now that I understand more about peaceful parenting and myself. It's really about embracing my own humanity so that I can embrace the humanity of my children. And so it's completely okay to mess up. It's a, I think the idea of failure is that sort of tiger parenting mindset where it's like, there's a certain standard. You need to get a hundred percent. You need to ace this thing. Otherwise you should be ashamed. You should feel you know, the mom guilt or whatever. And I'm really trying to move away from that where it's like, it's not about those expectations. It's not about doing everything perfectly. It's about how can I really hold space for all my emotions, understand my own needs, have good boundaries, like show myself so much grace and compassion, just like I want to do with my children. So this path of peaceful parenting has definitely been a lot about reparenting myself as well. Mm -hmm. Exactly what you said, embracing your humanity to embrace their humanity. So much of how we treat ourselves is interconnected yeah, and related to how we end up treating our kids then and how we see them and the story we tell ourselves and you know, all of that meaning that we correlate to those discipline moments and it's all and so interconnected. So I know that that wasn't a light switch, you know, from one day, one day I'm over here and the next day everything is different. So walk us through a little bit of the beginnings of that journey. Paint the picture of the parent that you were the first few years of your kid's life. Yeah. So I called my own journey untigering because I was that tiger parent, that tiger mom. So for those who might not be familiar with the term, it comes from Amy Chua's book, The Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mother. And she just sort of, you know, paints the picture of the Chinese immigrant parent that is very strict, has very high expectations for their children to obey and achieve so that they will be successful in life, you know? And so I think that's really tied perhaps to the immigrant mentality. And that's the type of parenting that I definitely grew up with. And it wasn't just my parents, you know, in some ways they might not have been that intense, but it's just the culture around me as well and school expectations, all of those things. And so I grew up just being the quote unquote good child, like obeying, doing everything I was expected to do, but feeling a lot of resentment along the way. And when I had kids of my own, I just assumed that that's what they should do as well. You know, like regardless of how they felt, they should still obey, still make me proud, still excel in whatever they tried. And particularly with my oldest child who was a sensitive and anxious child. And I didn't understand that about him. 
I thought like that he was difficult. I thought that he was disobedient, that he had tantrums all the time. And I didn't know how to handle it. I thought I just needed to come down harder on him, control him more, punish him harder. All of those things that were used on me that worked on me because I was a more compliant child. But for him, it just wasn't working. It was escalating it more and more. And I felt so much tension and anger and frustration with in my relationship with him. And I was not enjoying him, not enjoying being a parent. And that really scared me where it's like, oh my goodness, I don't actually like my child. Like, how did I get to this point? What do I need to do to heal this? And so coming to this point where I realized that the problem was not with him, but with me, one aha moment that I had was just going to like a parenting workshop and the speaker was sharing about neurobiology and about how children are really unable to regulate without our help. And if we come down harder on them, yell at them, punish them, that further dysregulates their brains and their bodies. And she showed us brain scans of, you know, what that looked like. And that was like a big light bulb moment for me because I realized the expectations that I had for him to obey and to be calm and rational and all of those things were unrealistic and unfair. And I wasn't really seeing the needs underneath all of that behavior. He was really crying out for help. He needed my help. He was having a hard time. But I just took it really personally and wanted just to like, you know, squash all of those emotions so that I could feel good about myself and I wouldn't have to deal with those behaviors or those, you know, emotions. And so that was a really big turning point for me where I just learned to have a lot more empathy and compassion and understanding instead of just judging the surface behavior. From that point, realizing that I had so much to learn, I started diving into like, you know, all these books and podcasts and resources online. And that's when I really began sharing my own journey too, as well, and have learned so much just by trying to find resources that really helped and challenged me and have begun sharing those with others. Which is so needed and so appreciated. And that's why your movement has you know, grown and your platforms are at the place they are because it attracts like-minded moms who want the same things and are working so hard to find the same resources. And they just benefit so much from that sense of community that, oh, I'm not the only one with a kid like this, or I'm not the only one that is, you know, trying to figure this out. And it feels really hard and confusing. But I know the place you were at, you know, with your understanding of discipline at the time and the strategies that you had, it's not coming from a place of, you know, manipulation or not wanting good things for your child. I'm sure that you were functioning from very good intentions. So what were some of those thoughts or maybe fears or things that you felt like you had to do to make him successful? Yeah. So I think, you know, also just coming from like a conservative religious background as well, I think played into I really did think that I was doing the right thing. You know, like I was raising responsible children. There were values that I wanted to instill in them, whether it was like sharing or apologizing or obeying or being thoughtful and all of those things. But I think what ended up happening was I was doing it in a very controlling and demanding way. So it was sort of like an outside in approach where I was trying to make them behave in a certain way instead of really cultivating it from inside out where it was actually part of their character. And part of that is really, they need freedom and autonomy. Like it cannot be forced upon them because that doesn't actually produce the character qualities that we want. It actually produces a lot of resentment, a lot of like performing, showing you a certain face in front of you and then turning their back and like doing something completely different. Right. So that's, not actually like, even though there are certain values and qualities that we want to see in our children and model for our children, doing it in that way is very counterproductive and 
really shoots ourselves in the foot. And so, yeah, I think there was after I learned about these things about, you know, peaceful parenting and all of that, there was like a lot of, you know, sadness and guilt and, and shame for what I did, thinking that it was right, thinking that what I was doing was good for them and good for our family and really seeing all the harm that it caused. But I think the beautiful thing is that when we take the time to repair, to, you know, take responsibility for our mistakes, to actually show that we are working hard to change and all of those things, that healing is possible, like the trust that I have rebuilt with my children is possible. So I didn't find this way of parenting until, you know, my children were quite a bit older, you know, like eight, six and eight. So their early childhood years, that time when it's so formative, you know, all the childhood development when I was tiger parenting and causing a lot of harm with my control and my anger and my punishment and all of those things. But, you know, when I started shifting and pivoting, there was a lot of healing and a lot of trust has been rebuilt. And so now that my children are older, we have like a great relationship and there's just so much love and trust and appreciation of each other now. And so it's never too late. I want to tell parents that it is definitely never too late. And it's not necessarily about those dramatic, you know, 180 changes either, even though like after that parenting workshop, I did, you know, stop spanking cold turkey. That was one thing that I was like, okay, this is causing so much harm. I've got to stop it. But, you know, we might have those moments, but a lot of it is just like the daily moment by moment interactions that we have too, where we're sewing back into that love and that trust and connection. I think that's so beautiful and so important to make the point to share because at any point when a parent begins to work on themselves and work on their parenting journey, there's always a before. And it's hard to reconcile with that before because when you know better, then you can choose differently or have more tools or have more understanding of even just, yeah, what's neurologically going on or why you get so upset in those moments. But until you have that information, you're doing the best you can with the knowledge and the tools that you have. And that is kind of a reckoning that every parent has to kind of go through if they decide based on new information to start to do things a little bit differently. And there is guilt and there's shame and there is regret. And so for you to be able to speak about that so publicly, how did you view that in a way that was healing? Yeah. I mean, needing to write about it in my book, a lot of people ask, like, how could you be so honest and vulnerable in your book about all your parenting failures? And I think part of it is like the very thing that we want to do with our children, which is to look past their behavior to understand the needs beneath their behavior, that to show them empathy and compassion. Those were things that I needed to offer myself as well. You know, that reparenting that we have to do where, yes, I was behaving in certain ways, but it was trying to meet a need. It was like a lack of understanding. It was like, you know, just to understand my inner child and the wounds that I was trying to meet by like needing to control another, you know, to control my child. So Again, like being rooted in that unconditional love for myself and the resistance of shame, the very things that we want to offer our children is like, no matter what they do, no matter how they behave, even the mistakes they make, even though they might be really bad and have dire consequences that I, as a parent, you know, want to communicate that I'm always there for them, that we will work through this together, that they are safe, that they are loved, they belong. Mm. And so... A lot of that was having to, you know, like work on healing those messages for myself and know like no matter what, no matter my quote unquote performance as a parent, I am loved and I am worthy of belonging and I'm safe. You know, all those those mantras that we want to speak to ourselves. So I think that helped me to get less defensive instead of like if my identity is threaten 
when I am not perfect, when I fail, then it's easy for me to get defensive and to like hold on to those ways of being without being reflective about it. But when I know that my identity is secure and I know that I'm safe and loved, then I can be more reflective and take responsibility and separate my actions from my worth and, and who I am. You know, like, oh, I made a bad choice there. And that was wrong. I can call it that and I can label it that because that doesn't like totally make my sense of self crumble, you know? And so I think that's something that I had to strengthen throughout the years. And especially, you know, now doing this more publicly and writing about it more publicly, needing to be really secure because it's easy for us to feel like imposters, right? Like, yeah, we talk about parenting and we encourage other people to parent a certain way, but then obviously we're not perfect either. And so, yeah, just being secure, more secure in who I am has been really helpful. Oh, that's huge. That's huge. And I think as sad as it is, a little bit of still a foreign concept to grownups at this stage of their life, if it wasn't modeled for them and that foundation wasn't laid by the ways that they were treated by their parents, hence the term reparenting, going back to laying kind of those building blocks of the meeting those deepest needs we have as humans. So for you, was that something that you could go back to or was that a new foundation that you had to lay? And if so, what steps did you take to do that? Yes, it was definitely new. (laughs) I think, you know, because what I, the messages that I received when I was young was that I needed to be good. I needed to perform. Yeah, just do what was right, perform, achieve not complain, all of those things in order to be loved. And all of that stuff is really implied. It's not like explicitly spoken, like our parents or our communities would never say that. But I saw how others were treated when they disobeyed. I saw, you know, the messages other people got when they didn't do well. And I also saw what happened when I did do well and the affirmation and all of those things that I got from that. And so I felt like a lot of it was, you know, based on behavior, my relationship, like my core relationships were all about behavior and pleasing the parent or doing what was expected. And so I had to unlearn a lot of that. And for me personally, like I mentioned, I grew up in like a conservative Christian upbringing. And so some of that was reinforced through that. And Part of my journey has been sort of like deconstructing a lot of those beliefs and experiencing my personal faith in a different way that is based on unconditional love so that I can offer that to myself. So it has been a huge healing journey and I continually get opportunities to practice it because it's like a lifelong journey. Yes, so true. And Important to remember as well, because again, if we have that conditioning to want to achieve, we want to be able to check the box, we want to be able to arrive, we want to be able to to either cling to something or know that I've done the thing or arrived. And and that's very hard with motherhood. There is no arriving. (laughs) It's evolving. Yes. And what's the name of your podcast again? Failing? Failing Motherhood. Yeah, Failing Motherhood. And I really feel like that's like in some ways, a helpful perspective in terms of like, instead of like winning motherhood or like perfecting motherhood. I mean, those are just really unrealistic expectations. And if we can accept that we are going to fail sometimes, you know, that it's going to be messy and imperfect, that there's just so much more ease and grace and playfulness and yeah, all of that for us. Hey, if you're new here, I'm Danielle. My company, Wholeheartedly, offers one-on-one and group coaching programs to help families with strong-willed kids age 1 to 7 prevent tantrums, eliminate power struggles, extend their patience, and get on the same page. It's kind of like finances. 
You can read lots of info about what a Roth IRA is and how the stock market works. But if you really want to get serious about paying down debt or growing your wealth, you go see a financial advisor who can give you very specific recommendations based on all the unique facets of your situation. I'm your financial advisor for parenting, and I've designed the way we work together to give you nothing less than a complete transformation. While we work together, I'm able to help you figure out why your child is losing their mind and why you are losing your mind and guide you to master effective long-term solutions through three main focuses. Number one, my cultivating cooperation guide, teaching you the tools of positive discipline. Number two, managing your mind by working through my triggers workbook. And number three, establishing your family's foundation by writing your family business plan. My coaching is comprehensive, practical, individualized, and full of VIP support. So if you struggle to manage your child's big emotions, if you and your partner's arguments seem to center around parenting, especially if one of you is too kind and one of you is too firm, if you struggle to stay calm and be the parent that you want to be, it's possible to stop feeling like a deer in headlights when a tantrum hits, effortlessly move through simple directions and care routines without an argument, and go to bed replaying the way you handled the hardest moments and feel proud. If you have a deep desire to be the best parent you can be and your family is your greatest investment, find me on Instagram, send me a message that says sanity, and I'll ask you a few questions to see if we'd be a good fit to work together. I can't wait to meet you. Back to the show. Yeah, because it takes away that shame of I need to hide in the corner and keep this away from others and, you know, bringing that out into the light and finding community with that. And then it normalizes, oh, I'm not the only one. And this is something that's an expected part of this journey. And I'm not far from where I need to be. Then I can feel okay with seeking out more resources or asking for help or talking to a friend or a professional because I do see a path to where I want to be either in my relationship with my child or, you know, the mentality that I want to portray. And so, yeah, I want to agree. Like I am a quote unquote parenting coach, parenting expert. And, you know, this weekend, my daughter like kicked my husband in the stomach and he didn't react according to the textbook. So like (laughs) we are still very much having human reality and not everything is going to be perfect and look perfect as much as you want to. And as much as you're learning and growing, there's always going to be an error for uh, normalness, I guess. (laughs) Yeah. I've heard it. I don't know if I have my numbers correct, but like even just parenting peacefully and gently, like was it 30% of the time or whatever is like a great, like children experience that as a great childhood when we get it right 30% of the time. I don't know if that's the right number, but that's a failing grade, right? (laughs) Very So (laughs) it's a failing grade, but it's like enough. And kids experience that as still like a wonderful childhood and they have good relationships, you know, even if we only get it right 30% of the time. So yes. Yes. I think that is an accurate percentage of like how often in like the attachment relationship, their needs need to be met in order to create like a secure attachment, it's like 30%. And so that's, I think it can be a very comforting thing to hear because we focus on the percent that isn't that much more. Right. (laughs) Yeah. So aim to fail. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And I think you'll probably surprise yourself by how well you're doing or you're not giving yourself credit for. I I guarantee it. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So one thing that I had found on your website was the phrase, you're moving from parenting that is rooted in power to parenting that is grounded in partnership. So tell us more about what that means to you. Yeah. So I felt like a lot of my parenting strategies or perspective before was based on hierarchy, was based on like the parent knows best. They have the right to control you and to like trump your desires and your needs to for their own comfort and all of those things. I wouldn't have said it that way, but it is definitely 
rooted in our dynamic where the parent has all the power and the child doesn't have any say, doesn't have any autonomy. And I think learning more about peaceful parenting and then starting to practice unschooling as well really challenged me to be partners with my children. Like they are their own people. So instead of me trying to shape them into what I want or expect them to be, really to honor them, to recognize that all of us have different needs. How can we negotiate them together? How can we find win-win solutions for everyone? So it's not top down. It's not just one person's needs, just like the ones with more power or even the children, like placing the children's needs completely and all the time above the parents' needs is not sustainable either. So this idea of partnership has been really powerful, but it's also not, I think I write in my book that it's not necessarily like an equal partnership where everybody gets a 50, 50, you know, everybody chips in the same percentage or whatever. It's like equity and not equality so that every person like is supported and given the resources that they need to thrive. And that is very personalized and unique for each individual and depends on development. And so those with more power actually are responsible for more and are responsible for sharing their power more than the members with less power. So yeah, I feel like this idea of partnership where we are working together as a team so that all of us thrive instead of an antagonistic relationship which I think is what is created when we use power over people. It just creates antagonism and tension and conflict. Mm -hmm. And what you saw with your son's behavior was the direct result of kind of that rejection of that power. Yeah, yeah. He was saying, no, I'm my own person. I'm not having any of that. And my initial response was like, okay, more power. I need to up my game. I need to yeah, exert more power over him until it just became clear that that wasn't going to work. So just seeing how I initially came to this in a very pragmatic way, like I say this where if my child, my especially my firstborn, had been compliant, I might never have found peaceful parenting because I would be like, oh, this is working. This is great. You know, <laughs> uh, I would have never questioned it. And so Sometimes it's like the conflict and where we come to the end of our ropes, where it pushes us and forces us to really reevaluate and question these patterns that we've accepted, you know? Mm -hmm. And I really refer to that as like the gift of having a very strong personality child, you know, whether you refer to that as strong willed or deeply spirited or sensitive or however, you know, that comes off to you. These kids are a gift because they do challenge the norms and they do push you to look in the mirror and see weaknesses and things that you need to address that you did not realize or a temper you didn't know you had. And there isn't growth. There is growth that we would not have had without these kids in our lives. And 100% that's my story as well. My first was very a uh, you know compliant child, a uh, very even keel emotions, not a lot of questions. And, you know, so it felt like, okay, this is a direct, you know, this is a direct reflection of me. I'm doing great as a parent. <laughs> and then I had my second daughter and that was flipped upside down and they were only 15 months apart. So it was very much like, this is not me at this point. Like what I'm doing isn't working for her. And that's when I had to find a whole new batch of insight and perspective to be able to deal with much bigger emotions and the reactions that were zero to 60 and the things that really bothered her because it felt controlling. She just absolutely could see right through that and really wanted to fight for her own voice and her own path and feel empowered. And that can feel very threatening if you're seeing things very hierarchically. That's not a word. <laughs> through the hierarchy. Hierarchically, yes. <laughs> yeah. And I'm so grateful because I think this really helps our compliant children too. Like when we shift our own parenting, we empower our compliant children to have more boundaries, to have more voice, to know that they don't have to perform in order 
to, you know, please us and all of those things. So I think, yeah, I'm so grateful that it's shifted our whole family dynamic. So even those compliant children can be more themselves. Yes, because, you know, you were that child. I was definitely that child growing up. And like you said, it's not spoken expectation. It's the unspoken expectations and the way that you just really begin to create this reality in your head of how you need to be and who you are to other people, that the more explicit we can be in creating the opposite or just holding space for that they can have emotions or that they don't need to be perfect and they are loved even if they don't get a perfect grade, that can be exactly the balm that that child needs that we didn't know they even needed to hear. Yeah, so important. So like you said, you're a self proclaimed overachiever and you know have all the accolades to prove it, right? You were very successful at school, graduated early with honors from a prestigious university, and now you're unschooling. So tell me a little bit about that evolution. Yeah. So that's all part of tiger parenting really, right? You know, it's just like where are you going to go to school? That's like all wrapped up in that. And that's something like culturally as Asian Americans that is like a high value for many of us. And yeah, what happened was we were living in China at the time. My husband and I moved there, you know, a few years after we got married and he was teaching English there at a university. And so we started, you know, having kids. So my children were both born overseas in China and definitely had the expectation that they would, of course, do well in school. <laughs> they would, that's the just unspoken that they would do that. And I think what happened was we couldn't get them into the local school because we were, you know, considered foreigners and they needed to serve their local community first. And so they didn't have any spaces for us. And so we were sort of running out of options in terms of what we could do for schooling, you know. We didn't want to send them to the international school that was really expensive and way across town. And so realizing like, okay, I'm going to have to homeschool full time. What is this going to look like? And probably just knowing myself as like a deconstructing tiger parent, like overachiever perfectionist, that if I was responsible for schooling my children, that that would cause a lot of tension, that I would expect them, (laughs) even though I know that I shouldn't, I would just really have a lot of expectations of them and get upset when they didn't, you know, tick off all the boxes. And so I just heard about unschooling during another parenting conference. One of the speakers was an unschooler and was like, so fascinated by it. It's like, what is this thing? I've never heard of anything like it. And went online, learned more about it, and just resonated so much with it. I think I was already on my peaceful parenting journey as well. And it just pretty much peaceful parenting, really. It's like respecting the child, honoring who they uniquely are, creating space for them to be children and their authentic selves. And so the more I read about it, the more I was like, okay, I think this is how I can homeschool in a way that won't tear our family apart, you know, just throw out all the expectations and just really pay attention to who they are and what they're into. And so it was like a huge choice for us because both of, you know, my husband and I are both traditionally educated. We went to public school and did all the things. So this was like, oh, this is going to be really different. But I think both of us having jumped through all those hoops, also saw all the harm in school. Like, even though we thought it's sort of like that good child syndrome, right? Like, you know, to do all the things, but there was all this harm that came from being that good child. It's the same thing with being a good student. Like you can be a good student and you can thrive and do all the things, but you internalize all these negative messages about your worth being tied to your grades, your performance, all of these things. And so we really saw like the negative effects of schooling in our own lives. And so we just treated it like an experiment where we weren't going to like have any curriculum that we decided on. We were going to have homework, tests, grades, any of that, and just 
like follow our child's lead, follow their lead and see what they were into and support them in that and just learn to live together. Yeah. And so we started that in 2017 and just have been going strong with that ever since. And I really feel like that has been so transformative to our lives and our relationship with one another. It's because we have time to be together. We have time to work through like conflicts, to really get to know one another, to listen to our bodies, to really experience autonomy and agency in the ways that we want to live our lives. So it's really been transformative for us. Wow. I'm so glad. And so what does that look like now as they're a little bit older on like a day-to-day basis? So I think we moved back to the States and then the pandemic hit. And so we were sort of like cloistered in our home for months on end. And it was hard for us to build relationships, right? Because we had just moved here and we couldn't meet in person with people. It was hard to find community. And then, so I think especially as my children get older and those peer relationships like become really valuable and meaningful for them, my oldest was really asking for more ways to connect with other people, with other you know peers on a regular basis. And so we found like a self-directed learning center for them that they go to twice a week. So it's not school in the normal understanding of it. It's like they offer courses and classes, but you're not required to go and there's no test. It's just like offering learning and information. And so they do that twice a week. And then the other three days of the week, they are home with us and, you know, they can wake up when they want to and just spend their day. Like usually in the beginning of the week, they might have some goals that they set for the week. It's like, okay, this is what I want to do for this week. And oftentimes Like it doesn't look schoolish. It's not like, oh, I'm going to write a five paragraph paper on, you know, the history of whatever. It's like, I'm going to be coding. I'm going to be animating something online. I'm going to be drawing, doing an art collab with somebody. I'm going to read this book that I want to read. I'm going to be playing video games. And so, yeah, all of those things. I think for me, like the unschooling, de-schooling process has been to like remove those or to redefine my beliefs about what learning is, what education looks like, you know, and it doesn't have to be in those very schoolish ways where we're just fed information that some adult somewhere decided that a fourth grader needs to learn, you know, but then you grow up and you're like, I don't remember any of that. This is really about, yeah, seeing what it is that they love and are passionate about and supporting them in that. And there's so much learning that happens within the context of their passion and their interest and their curiosities. Mm. And I bet they actually have a love of learning that you have cultivated. Yeah, exactly. Because it's not forced on them. But I think it's also something that we, that I need to check for myself too, because like, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be, go out and be engineers or like create their own company or whatever. Like it can be very more casual. Like I think it's easy to choose unschooling when you have a very driven child who's going to like meet all those tiger parent expectations anyway, (laughs) just outside of school. But really, this process has been like, they get to live their own lives. And if they don't want to, like, become a professional, you know, animator, that's fine. They're just doing this for fun. They're just engaging with it and learning from it. I don't have to, like, funnel them into becoming, like, you know, just just excelling, quote unquote, in that field. Because I feel like, again, that's just projecting our adult expectations on them, like, really focusing on capitalism and making money and what's your career going to be instead of just allowing them to be who they are and enjoy, enjoy their interests in the moment. And, you know, next in a couple of months, those interests might shift and that's completely okay as well. So again, following their lead and just enjoying it with them. Yeah. Which can feel so 
backwards and uncomfortable when, you know, that's not the way that you were raised and that's not the conditioning of the society and the, or the culture that you have been raised in. So it can feel a little bit scary to trust your child or to trust that process. So I'm sure that it helps to have a little bit of checks and balances or some overall principles, you know, that kind of ground you or some, you know, plans of other resources that you can connect with to make sure that you have other places to put your confidence in other than just their, I guess, lack of report card, right? (laughs) (laughs) Right. Because it's so easy for us who've gone through the system to put our trust in the system, right? To believe like, okay, they've graduated or they, you know, got promoted from eighth grade. So that means that they're okay. When it really doesn't mean anything (laughs) and there are no guarantees. And so it does take a lot of faith and trust to pursue this way of life where you know, we haven't really seen it done as much or so we don't feel like there are safety nets or guarantees. But when we really think about it, there aren't those safety nets with school either. You know, you can graduate from college and still really struggle to find a job. You know, there's so many factors that are in play. And so instead of putting our trust in those systems, how can we put more trust into our children, into like equipping them with the ability to learn, the ability to figure out life, to know themselves. I think that's a big thing about unschooling is like where children really are given the space to know themselves. Whereas when you're in the school environment, you are taught to really suppress a lot of your own knowing, your own desires, your own priorities, your own interests, your bodily needs, all of that gets suppressed in order to fit into this system. So Unschooling really allows us to live, like not need to submit to that system and really know ourselves instead. And then to choose a life, choose the path forward that is meaningful for us instead of, again, trying to fit ourselves into those systems. Mm, Which is such a huge life lesson, powerful skill set that we can empower our kids with for the long haul that you know, isn't always an immediate gratification tomorrow. We see that payoff, but, you know, years and years down the road. Yes, absolutely. Because I think a lot of, you know, just as we grow up and if we look at the society around us, like we need more people who can stand up to systems, right? Stand up to injustice, who know themselves and won't just say yes to everything that comes their way. Yeah. And I think that's something that we're just beginning to awaken to in a lot of ways, but still needing to do a ton of work on really questioning almost everything. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. So I love that you can just kind of share what that has looked like for your family, because sometimes it's, you don't know that it's possible unless you really kind of see what that journey looks like, or even know that unschooling exists. And so I'm excited to kind of share that from that first person lens and and then your boys are thriving. Yeah, they are. And it's just, I'm just so amazed and encouraged by this process. And I think, you know, I've been asked like, what what's the one thing that you appreciate most about unschooling? And that I definitely have to say, it's like the relationship that we have with one another because of it, you know, just being able to be together and to build that connection and that relationship. And also when you're around each other all the time, you really need to learn to communicate and you really need to have boundaries, right? So it's not just a free for all. It's not like everybody off doing whatever they want because that can just lead to so much chaos and tension. And that's not what we're about. You know, it's really about like, all of us matter and all of us need to figure out how to live in harmony together. And so how can we all get our needs met? Yeah, so much opportunity for collaborative problem solving (laughs) and creating plans and yeah, speaking up for yourself, all of the life skills that we want to, you know, have practice with creating a safe container to do that so that they feel confident being able to, you know, do that with themselves and later on with friends and coworkers and, you know, their future partner and all of that. That's great. So to start to wrap up, if there is like one pedestal that I can 
give to you that you can stand up on and you can just speak from, what do you feel like you love to make sure to drive home to other moms? What do you feel like they need to hear? Yeah, I think it would just go back to what I was saying in the beginning about like, we get to be human, you know, that we're all human. And so embracing that humanity, you know, whether that means like our vulnerability, our mistakes, our emotions, all of that. I think that has been really pivotal and healing for me to like, again, let go of those impossible expectations that we often place on ourselves and really just show ourselves a lot of compassion and grace. Mm, So needed. Yes. And so how can listeners connect with you and your work and your book? Yeah. So you can buy my book, which is called Untigering, Peaceful Parenting for the Deconstructing Tiger Parent. You can find that on Amazon or pretty much anywhere where you buy books. And also my blog, untigering.com. And the social media pages or platforms that I'm most active are Facebook and Instagram. I'm also just at untigering on those platforms. Perfect. And I'll put the links to those in the show notes for an easy click. And so lastly, what I ask every guest that comes on is how are you the mom that your kids need? I think I am the mom that my kids need by being fully myself. So by not trying to be (laughs) the mom that they need, but by being honest and authentic about who I am and taking, you know, repairing and apologizing when I'm not what they need. So I think, again, it's really about myself and the work that I need to do on myself and embracing myself and coming to them as fully myself in all my messiness as well. (laughs) Mm -hmm. No, I know that they are so lucky to have had you on that journey and be living that journey out loud and bringing them alongside all of your healing with you. That's such a gift that you can give them. And I know your relationship with them is so strong. So they are so blessed to have you as their mom. Thank you. Of course. Well, thank you again for your time. This was a great conversation. And I really appreciate all of your honesty and everything you shared. Thank you. It's a great talk. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Failing Motherhood. Your kids are so lucky to have you. If you loved this episode, take a screenshot right now and share it in your Instagram stories and tag me. If you're loving the podcast, be sure that you've subscribed and leave a review so we can help more moms know that they are not alone if they feel like they're failing motherhood on a daily basis. And if you're ready to transform your relationship with your strong-willed child and invest in the support you need to make it happen, schedule your free consultation using the link in the show notes. I can't wait to meet you. Thanks for coming on this journey with me. I believe in you and I'm cheering you on. Thank you.